Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's bonus episode. We have many exciting things to tell you about, teach you about, <laughs> talk to you about, explain to you, let you in on uh -huh. from our main episode. So we had this whole linen underwear metaphor, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. Never, never in my life heard of this one. This one did not end up in my Sunday school lesson. Mm -hmm. But I it did bring up some why. questions. Well, my initial question was, first of all, what the hell is going on? And then second of all, is the fact that it's linen significant? Is that like a cheap, crappy kind of underwear? Is it an expensive, nice kind of underwear? Because I think that knowing that probably changes our understanding. Mm. Yeah, of... it does breathe nicely. That's true. Yeah. It does breathe. I, I do associate linen with like, I'm a rich hippie. Uh -huh. afford really good linen thing it's kind of been my aspirational mm -hmm. cloth mm -hmm. really someday yeah. to have some good a good summer wardrobe that's all really nice uh -huh. high quality linen goods yeah uh -huh. i'll make it there someday yeah anyway at this time uh my hunch was correct that yes linen was quite costly well okay. there's a couple different tiers of linen right oh. you know there was the more rough spun tier that would be maybe more accessible to the working folk but then there was the like really really finely woven finely spun tier of linen that was only affordable by rich people mm. now the most significant thing is that linen was also something that was specifically used for priestly garments and they actually mm -hmm. laid that out in the torah or some somewhere in like Exodus or Leviticus or something like that, that it was specifically the priest garments had to be made out of oh, linen. So Okay, so maybe that's significant. Kind of be like, this is your yeah, special there holy is that fabric. significance of a prophet showing up in linen. A linen shorts. Mm. Linen shorts. <laughs> Eat my <laughs> shorts. That are supposed to only be for the priests. That's something. Um, there's also the fact that like ancient Egypt specifically was noted for its like fine linen and making really, really good mm. linen and it's linen exports mm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it was used not only for really good garments, but, and also for priests, but also was used for shrouds, um, would be used for like tapestries, potentially um, just any kind of like really, really fancy. Uh, whenever you need a fancy cloth, you know, you know, those times. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think at this time, this is also probably the closest we can get to something actually being white, right? An actual naturally white cloth. Is hmm. really okay. So what? So when I think of linen, I think of it being kind of like a, a slightly off-white kind of beigey color. Yes. But yeah. I guess compared to like what were the other fabrics at the time? I guess I just don't know a lot about historical textiles. Did cotton exist? It's a great probably question. Must have because I think Egypt oh. had cotton. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Cotton. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That but makes even sense. natural cotton, even like unbleached cotton also has a kind of off-white sort of yeah. look okay. to it. Yeah. But at this time, it's like before you're really bleaching things, which I don't know who figured out bleaching first. It, that is still an ancient thing, but right. with bleaching not being super common, it's like it's you're still aiming for like an off-white, and that's the closest you can get to some kind of like quote-unquote like kind of pure-looking garment is the linen. Yeah. Right. Whoa. Yeah, Does yeah, I guess so. Sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, so when wait, I picture Pharaoh, I picture him wearing like nice white cotton, but that's probably mm -hmm. just my modern day like movie version of Pharaoh. So I don't know. Well, I didn't look up the history of bleaching. I can <laughs> sure, save that for sure. <laughs> a different time. I can time. Google that while the rest of you are talking about your bits, and I can let you know what came up with that. Um, but a couple other interesting things that I found out is. Um, I found an interesting blog that was talking about how, of course, like in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, there's a really famous rule around not mixing fibers, right? Yeah, okay. what's, yeah, yeah, I was very clear it, about don't mix linen fibers with wool. And there's a number of different theories for that. Um, some scholars speculate that it's like linen represents like the plant world and wool represents the animal world and wool's mm. normally reserved for like animal sacrifices. And so it's this idea of like, let's just not blend those two together in a symbolic sort of way. Interesting. Oh, okay. So that, that might be the whole mixing fabrics situation. Maybe. Yeah. Again, I know I've heard other theories about, again, this is yet right. another thing to distinguish you from the other peoples that are around you because they right. do this whole right. fabric mixing thing. And so we're going to be very clear about not doing that. Um, Linden is even mentioned in Revelations. So Revelations 19.8 says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. 
So there's very much a connection with hmm. purity and finery. Huh. Okay. And so I guess the cool. significance then of taking this very pure, fine thing, sweating your junk all over it, hiding <laughs> it in a rock, and then <laughs> pulling it out and being like, this is you. This is what yeah, I'm going to do to you. Yeah. yeah okay. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Essentially, it's just wow. like taking one of the nicest things that you could own at the time and getting it all janky and then yeah. like. Useless. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well. Yeah. No, this is funny because I, I, I stumbled. Every time I stumble onto some weird Christian blog. Yeah. Every time. There, there's a lot of them around. So there's that a makes lot. sense. This today I found spiritually unequal marriage.com, which sounds like a URL that you would. Whoa. Reserve, spiritually, spiritually unequal, unequal marriage. marriage. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. Right. A really. Yeah. It, and because Yikes. this person wrote a blog post way back in 2007, kind of m- making a very stretched and tortured metaphor about the fine linen belt thing about like you can be that fine linen belt like you don't need to push the gospel on your spouse but you can be like your acts can represent this righteousness and they can see like it was very much a, oh, okay. to me a very Whoa. christian thing i'm going to seize on one little part of a metaphor and just and run really with it. really just yeah. go wherever i want not with no regard like for line. the context this line was in the blog post where she says, isn't it so like God to use a metaphor to reflect his meaning on so many levels? And I think it's so like you, blog person. <laughs> well, okay, yes. However, I, this person is correct. Because After Jeremiah, Jeremiah you're with, right. Like, Yahweh's just every single metaphor he can possibly whip out. I'm like, yeah, That's true. it's like God to use a met to use 600 different metaphors to try to reflect his meaning on 600 That's different true. levels. And in Isaiah, okay. too, same thing. It's just metaphor after metaphor after metaphor. We, we yeah. couldn't even keep straight which is metaphor and what's real. So, yeah, that is, mm. yeah, they're not wrong. That is very Yahweh. This wow. is so Raven. And what I found from a very, 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 very quick Google search is that the earliest form of bleaching fabric would, okay. you know, involve laying them out in a field to be whitened by the sun, right? Huh. Uh, okay. Throw some lemons on it, like whiten your teeth. Yeah. At some point in the ancient world, we figured out also ammonia worked. So like if you collected your own urine, you could essentially kind of condense it down to get the ammonia out of it that then would help with the bleaching process. Like and you're very helps make your great. yellow belt. Adaptable and very resourceful. Awesome. Helps make your yellow belts wow. for your martial arts training. And, make, and then you can make your yellow belts while you're at it. <laughs> there you go. Oh my gosh. Wow. All right. Well, from linen to birds, I, I looked up three different bird-related things. One is the speckled bird of prey. So there are many. If you just type in speckled bird of prey, it comes up with a bunch of really pretty boys. Um, uh-huh. A lot of them are like, what, falcons, hawks, stuff like that. Yeah, C- Cooper's hawk. Um, they're around Scotland and the UK. And then I've definitely seen hawks that look like this around here, even around Los Angeles. Some of them are really beautiful. Wow. I, I just, oh, this one looks like it's it's from Moscow. It's like oh. a, a Russian bird. He's very oh, jaunty. Moscow hawk. Yeah. I'm assuming there's some hawks that were local to this area, like to ancient Israel. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't even look that up, but probably. <laughs> she got I just so distracted up by these. bird of prey. She got distracted by birds. <laughs> yeah, just birds in general. I was like, oh, oh, but yes, it shows Jeremiah 12, 9. So there it is. Is not my inheritance to me like a speckled bird. Alrighty, and then I looked up if peacocks like humans, and apparently not much. Just peacocks don't really like to be petted. They'll allow sometimes for some physical contact. But they're generally aggressive, fiercely territorial birds. I have heard they are very, yeah, yeah. They're very smart. They're very, very smart. And then I looked up: Has a peacock ever killed anyone? And apparently, in Bangkok, Thailand, a pet peacock mauled his master, killing him in a freak (gasps) accident. Oh, yikes! Oh my god, that's awful. Wow. Oh, but this is nice. They said that the family would spare the killer bird's life, donating all four peacocks to a local zoo. Well, that's nice. Jeez. I'm glad. I I am torn about that. I'm not I'm torn. I <sighs> nah. the peacock killed a human. Eh. Yeah, that's I know. I'm on the only side here. I'm like, no. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, you shouldn't like keep peacocks as pets, in my opinion. Like they they belong maybe in a conservatory or something like that. Like, is that not keeping it as a pet? I guess it, no, it, it depends it, on the it, conditions, right? Yeah, we don't know. Animal, There's a lot we don't know right? here. Yeah, we don't know. 
Yeah, that that is pretty, I like, I don't know how the heck that would happen, but... All right, finally, Jace alluded to this fact that ostriches are, like, obsessed with humans. Hot for humans is what I said. Hot for humans, yeah. And they are. I, I just want to reiterate that I have... There is an ostrich ranch type thing. It's like a, a, a place thing. that you can... Yeah, it's like a place that you can go and feed the ostriches and do, you know, some... Uh, look at their... You can buy their eggs, like ostrich eggs and uh-huh. hopefully unfertilized um and it's on the way from phoenix to tucson and so these yeah, things exist out there before yeah yeah we definitely have absolutely so when an ostrich is raised entirely by humans it has a significant impact on the disposition of their life and of who they become these ostriches so they court humans and I was doing a little dance. It just saw me and was laughing at me. But this is, I was trying to do the ostrich mating dance. So the males will do a little courtship dance, flapping his wings out, squatting down and waving his neck back and forth. And so if the female likes what she sees, she'll flap her wings backwards while bending her neck forward and making a clapping noise with her beak. Oh, wait, so it's, it's like a call and response kind of dance? Yeah, they each have their own yeah. moves. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Yeah, but it says that it turned out that the farmers were noticing more of this behavior when the farmers themselves were present. So the farmers mm-hmm. were like turning the ostriches on, <laughs> which is awesome. No. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So let's see. What does this say? It's like 70%. Yes, yeah, 70% of the ostriches reliably hit on humans when they were around. <laughs> is that the scientific oh my... term for it? Hitting on them? Well, they like doing the their research dance. team. Yeah. yeah. A research team headed up by ostrich expert Charles Deming set about determining whether the ostriches were getting fresh with their human handlers. <laughs> and apparently they were. They were. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I love it. I I mean, just be careful. Like, they're not going to be able to mate with you. And apparently mating with an ostrich, like trying to get near an ostrich when it wants to mate with you is very scary and not a good mm. thing because they're very heavy birds and their right. talons big, and beaks are very babies. sharp. Yeah, They're big babies and so they're they sharp could boys. They really do the business too, yeah. Yikes. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I'm yes. so much no, more I... uncomfortable about birds in general now <laughs> today. You know what? I've always felt like birds are quite scary, actually. Like they're it little really... dino- they're dinosaurs. They're yeah, truly that's... dinosaurs. Just okay. Claws. Yeah, yeah. They're just like yeah. a... some of my cousins had a bird who was just a jerk. It's a real not nice cockatiel or something like that. And I was just like, why would you have this? It's noisy, it's awful, it's mean, and it's scary. Like why why do you oh have a bird gosh. as a pet? I've 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 known other people who had bird pets who were actually cute and, and fun, but like in general, I'm like, you know what, birds, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. Let's just kind of keep that separate. Do our things. Yeah, do our separate things. Oh my gosh. Wow. I'm glad, I, yeah. I feel good knowing that this this is real and that you, Emily, have verified this and it's not just me trying no, to it, convince everyone that ostriches yeah. are into humans. It's not some BS. It has been scientifically proven or something. <laughs> or something. Something to that. observed. Yeah, yeah, scientifically observed. They're flirting. <laughs> They're flirting with the farmers. They're yep. like, wow, that bipedal bird is really sexy. Let's do this. Yeah, I just want to check if flirting with farmers is available for flirting with farmers.com that is available I love so oh my gosh you want to start an ostrich kevin, dating sex- site <laughs> these videos are amazing kevin the sexually confused ostrich is that ostrich flirting with me from a to b gosh <laughs> his name is okay. kevin even kevin the ostrich even better yeah yeah wow yeah. okay so so last week i talked to you about this this blog post that what yeah. I learned from, so I, I bought this book called Children of Baal, and it is part of the Baal trilogy. Again, I don't know if there are any more books yet. It's available for 99 cents on Kindle. So if you want to check it out for yourself, why not? Uh, it's, it's not a very long book. And as I said in the episode, it's not amazing writing. It's not brilliant, but it's mm-hmm. also not terrible. And so, you know, 
it's fun. If you're looking for some fun reading, go for it. Uh, however, depending on your disposition about Yahweh and Judaism and things, it also could be a very offensive book to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. I've read about a third of it. I read it on my flight from LA or from Seattle here to LA. And so I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to give you some spoilers. So if you, the listener are like, Excited. Nope, I'm going to get this book. I don't want any spoilers. And I'm only, I can only spoil the first third of the book. So don't worry. I'm not going to ruin the whole thing. I, I'm still on the edge of my seat. I don't know where it's going, but uh, I can give you a little bit of spoilers about kind of the premise of it. But if you want to check out this book yourself, goodbye we will see you next week or not well we're taking a week off but then we'll see you the week after that see you on the next episode but if you're okay with a little bit of just a touch of spoilage just the slightest spoilums here's the deal essentially the premise of the book is that this dude named nero which is cool uh nero, nero. is a visiting professor in beirut and sort of gets mixed up with this grad student and this professor from another university who are both really into Baal and okay. who are trying to track down this modern day sort of cult or group that still worships Baal. Um, but they're both really into Baal and, and our main character is like weirded out by this and thinks they might be a little, a little, you know, off their rockers or something at first. But is just so intrigued. He's kind of going along with it. And he was raised Christian. So, so what's funny is his interpretation of a lot of stuff is kind of similar to things that we've talked about on our show where, you know, they'll be talking to him about some stuff about Baal or about Yahweh. And he's like, I vaguely remember something about that happening to King Solomon. And they're like, right, exactly. It's this chapter, this verse. And, you know, they're really up on it but he's like reading the bible to try to check on these things and okay. there's some funny moments when he's like so i was reading last night and there was something where like they were getting really upset about people worshiping the baals on the high places whatever those are and i was just like <laughs> yeah right exactly. yeah, good, great question <laughs> oh my gosh um but okay here's the deal here's basically the idea is that these two believe that there's been this two to 3,000 year conspiracy that has led us all to the world we're in today where everyone worships Yahweh and not Baal and that okay. all the gods are real and they go to that whole thing of like they talk about gods being plural all the time and like in Genesis, you know, we made man in our image, this whole thing of like that was a team effort and it wasn't until later that this whole idea of Yahweh being the only God came into vogue. And so it's, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we've, we've talked about some of that. It's like, you know, that that's why I've enjoyed it. Cause it's a lot of stuff we've already kind of entertained or, or joked about on our show. Yeah. But they bring up a couple interesting things. One is that in the Canaanite pantheon, there was this God named El, who was the sort of King of the, the pantheon of gods, right? He was like the head of the divine council. And he is, Yahoo's father, who later became what, um, Yahweh. Um, excuse me, Yahoo, 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 Yahoo. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Yahoo's uh, father, and wait. according to this, Yahoo's mother was Ashtoreth, aka Whoa. Ashtoreth. Whoa. Okay, it's getting all confusing up in here. Whoa. Yes. Wait, uh, wait, are you are you making fun of the fact that you said Yahoo, but Yahoo is not a real person? No, no, Yahoo is the Canaanite name that eventually became uh, Yahweh. Oh, but they're the same person. They're the same character. Okay, so they're laying out this conspiracy that Yahweh okay. started out as a Canaanite god who is actually the son of Asherah. Yes, and that then Baal was Asherah's nephew which I guess would then make him Yahweh's cousin, I guess, or maybe also nephew, kind of depending Once on how removed. that worked out. There's also, you know, like a lot of um, Greek and Roman mythology, there's a lot of incest among the gods too, so the family oh, yeah, trees they, are a little fuzzy. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love that. But anyway, here's here goes the story that they present, is that Baal comes along, and even though Yahu, Yahweh is El's son, Baal like, really ingratiates himself to El, 
and it's just so hot and everyone is so into him partly probably because he's the so fertility hot, right? god and also the god of like the rains and lightning and stuff and so he's just so hot and so cool and everyone loves him and yahweh is jealous and yahweh at that time is the sea god he's the god of the sea the god of the deep what? yeah look in the canaanite okay. pantheon yahweh is the god of the sea and Baal is the god of fertility and also of rain and, and crops and harvests and stuff like that. Way and more. Yahweh is They're jealous. Both. And he goes to El and he's like, give me permission to teach this god a lesson and capture him. And Jeez. El's like, sure, go for it, man. And he tries, and ba but Baal beats him anyway. And everyone's celebrating Baal and all the worshippers of Baal are super happy. Uh, but then Yahweh eventually, you know, creates this idea of him being the only god and his followers really perpetuate this idea Whoa. and they succeed at it to to the point that thousands and thousands of years later we now all all we know is yahweh and that no one thinks that there are any other gods Jeez, he makes a couple of fun points and again i love this whole conspiracy theory stuff is that he's a jealous god right and yahweh yeah. himself has told us that in what we've read right in the hebrew bible is like for i your god am a jealous god you shall have no other gods before me right that whole thing and then also this this is where it gets wild so then he says it's not wild yet it's not wild yet just wait just wait here here it comes they get to the whole thou shalt make no graven image of anything you know above or below or whatever and essentially the main character is like this but this i don't understand He's like, I understand if Yahweh's like, don't make images of other gods and worship them. But why would he want people to not make images of himself? Right? That's like not God's stuff. Like all the gods want that, right? You, you want statues yeah, to God's you. And, and right? So like, what, what's the deal? Now here's, here's where it gets cool. So remember, Yahweh in Canaanite mythology was the god of the deep, was the god of the oceans, and was represented by either a dragon or a serpent. Okay. Now, serpent in the Garden of Eden was the one tempting humans, yeah. right? To do the bad That's things. That's true. Okay, there's piece number one. Piece number two, in Exodus, remember when everyone, like people are complaining and whining or whatever, like they always do, and Yahweh gets mad and he sends all these serpents to the fiery serpents, who were like attacking and, and killing everybody. And that the solution was that Yahweh told Moses, build a staff with a serpent on it, right. like a brass serpent or whatever it was. And okay. if people get infected by these, these fire serpents, have them bow down and worship this thing and they'll get better. Okay. So they're saying that Yahweh is the serpent and that Yahweh was the serpent Whoa. in the Garden of Eden. Wow. What? And that he then later realized this was an image problem. And so he said, no graven images. I don't want any pictures of me because I don't, I want to distance myself from the fact that I'm actually the devil. And so they're saying, like, essentially, we've all been tricked for thousands of years into worshiping the devil and thinking that Baal's the devil when really he's that's the good guy. And then I was like, whoa. That's amazing. I'll, I'll yeah. hand it to them. I will hand it to them. That's pretty clever. It's, it's fun. Clever... It's a fun story. Yes, that's yeah. fun. That's fun. <laughs> that's that would be fun. such an irony that all these Christians whole time we've been worshiping the right. devil, actually. Yeah. Um, and the last thing is wow. that the Exodus never happened. And we've talked about this a little bit, that there's no like historical evidence of that. No other historical records to verify them being captured by the, the Egyptians and the Exodus and stuff. Or at least not like verifiable other sources. The idea is that they were a Canaanite tribe from the start who decided to be this Yahweh-only club and they kind of made up this story about them coming from Egypt and that that hmm. justified them conquering everyone else mm -hmm. and taking over. Wow. It was wild wow, stuff. Wow. Anyway, it was a wild, wild ride on my plane yeah. reading this. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know where it's going wow. yet. I don't know where we're going with this. I'm assuming yeah, I mean, that our main character is going to become a follower of Baal. It has to happen, right? Gotta be, right? But, like, if oh, we're I'm setting sure. Baal's actually the good guy, but then maybe there's going to be an extra conspiracy where it's like, oh, but they actually are kind of evil. A second la like, layer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, extra layers on top of layers. Well, y'all have yeah. to keep it posted how the children of Baal are getting on. Yeah, I'm really I don't want to wanna spoil hearing. it too much for people in case they want to read it themselves. But yes, it's been fun. Okay.
Wow. Unbelievable. My goodness. Well, as always, we have some fun and exciting things coming to you in the coming weeks. But do remember that next week we are taking a single week off so that I can go and learn more about Baal in (laughs) the city of Las Vegas. I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I'll let you know what happens when I return. And uh, we hope you have a great week off, and we'll see you next time on Drunk Bible Study.